also right. very warm welcome to this Tuesday talk <clears throat> by Jose Manuel Mendes. Jose is professor at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, and he's a sociologist by training, and he's currently an associate professor at Coimbra with Habilitation. And he told me yesterday that Portugal uh, sticks to the German system and they are still required to do habilitations, which I found quite interesting because Germany is sort of um, departing from that model a bit in recent decades. Uh, but the most important part is that Jose um, is also coordinator of the risk observatory, the OSIRIS of the Center for Social Studies. And he's also a renowned expert in the fields of risk and social vulnerability, planning, public policy, and citizenship. So with today's talk uh, on invisible citizenship, de-democratization, and public policies, he'll give us an insight on his experiences working on the risk observatory and at the University of Coimbra. Thank you, Jose. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Pia, for the kind presentation. Um, good afternoon to you all. Uh, I would like to thank the Institute for inviting me and setting me to be here only for a short month, uh, but to be here as a fellow. I would like to thank, of course, Professor Ortwin Hen, Ren and uh, Ahim and Pia for the dialogue and uh, uh, Aneta for the organization. And of course, uh, Professor Ilan Chabay that had a wonderful talk with me the first day I arrived and that you will see that talk reflected in this presentation today. <laughs> what I called the Ilan hypothesis. I don't, I don't think he minds that I will use it after our conversation. So uh, I entitled the, uh, the presentation Invisible Citizenship, Democratiza the Democratization and Public Policies. And um, I started working uh, first in social uh, politics and social movements, and then uh, went to uh, social vulnerability. It worked with uh, Susan Cutter and produced uh, Center for Social Studies uh, um, Social Vulnerability Index that has been applied in three municipalities in Portugal, and they have been incorporated in the civil protection and emergency planning. Uh, and now it's being tested and applied in Brazil in the 19 municipalities of Rio de Janeiro. And we, I have, we have recently published two, uh, two papers that consolidate the, our proposal of a social vulnerability index. But in the last years, I have been working with victims and victims associations and the, the notion of citizenship and what I call following Charles Steele, the democratization. But this is the matter of the talk for today. So I will go forward. And I will start with this famous Paul Klee painting, Angelus Novos, that Walter Benjamin uh, wrote his thesis nine about the angel of history and how it looks at the ruins of the past and it's going backwards towards the future. And also, the precarity of things that we live, the daily life. And this uh, portrait, this painting by René Magritte, Magritte, a memory of a journey. I hope that I can visit again his museum in Brussels and have the time to, to see this painting alive. Uh, just to remember and to contextualize some major uh, events like the earthquake in Haiti, 2010, more or less 300,000 people died. The Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, more or less also 300,000 people. The fire, forest fires in Portugal, 2017, where 120 people died, many inside their cars when the fire came. And uh, the, the Paris, uh, the heat wave, Paris heat wave, 2003, where uh, an over mortality in France of 15,000 in Europe, of 60,000, uh, 60, and also the heat wave in Russia uh, a few years after of 60,000 over mortality. And to contextualize again, I will just say that this is a documentary that produced by Leonardo de, DiCaprio about the Portuguese forest fires. It's now in the commercial circuit, 
And Hollywood has looked at these fires and it's a 30 minute documentary produced by Leonardo DiCaprio about this Portuguese fires from Devil's Breath. And to contextualize, as you know, some of you are specialists in the field, but this is the global deaths for natural disasters. Of course, the uh, flu uh, 1918 is not here. It's only natural disaster, drought, floods, extreme weather. And the economic impact, this, this, this big line is the Japan earthquake and tsunami 2010. And a study also, how many lives does it take for the major United States networks to take account of a disaster or something? And it takes 91 deaths in the Pacific, 45 deaths in Africa, 43 in Asia, three in Southern Central America, it's close to them, and in Europe, one. So I will go forward and enter my subject, what uh, Sheila Jasanov has called public health sovereignty. And for her, the state, through this COVID prevention and containment measures, we are in it again, such as mask mandates, physical distance, quarantine, curfew, and lockdown, ostensibly exerts both bio power and bio politics, exposing the tensions between the ideals of health security, us as biological beings, and citizenship, us as socio political beings, and between individual freedom and responsibility towards others. We are seeing many, many demonstrations in Europe against the, the rules the, uh, and all that. We can discuss that afterwards. Um, and in February this year, uh, her team, a big team from Harvard and many uh, colleagues around the, the world uh, published the report about comparative COVID, COVID response. And and she proposed here a table, they propose a table or analysis. And I will say that Taiwan is more or less like they told the, us and they wrote. But for Germany, consensus and for United States, chaos, no. Germany, I want to go into details because you are more experts than me, of course. Uh, and the United States with Biden arriving uh, to power, things change completely. So after six months of this, renowned uh, uh, report, uh, everything changed and practically we can't take anything from what is in this uh, table. So instead of public health sovereignty, I like to reflect about this as sanitary nationalism. There is um, in the sanitary sovereignty, some people propose in South America. So instead of sovereignty, sanitary nationalism. And the consequences of sanitary nationalism, first, I argue, is the democratization of public policies and risk regulation and social life. Second, the strengthening the role of experts and scientific knowledge. This I have to say that, uh, and pardon me, those uh, colleagues, but I was very surprised to see the, how uh, the, the director of the Koch Institute, Lothar uh, Wieler, talked the emotional way, the exa uh, almost exasperated. And it's not a good way to do, to do risk communication. And in that, it's not a good way to transmit for at least what we do and I do as a consultant uh, in Portugal for many entities and all that. But we can discuss that after uh, afterwards. And a decrease in the relevance of citizenship claims and rights. And the um, concrete impact, there is uh, this philosopher, Italian Giorgio Agaben, a little bit controversial, he has been reading uh, about the COVID, but he says, and he's right, that every social phenomenon has or can have political implications, of course. And he asks, what are the consequences on the notion of social distancing? Why social distancing and not physical distancing? That's what it is. And the only case that I know, that I've been studying, uh, of 500 families of COVID victims that are seeking a total of 100 million in compensation from the Italian government. The movement is Noi Denunciaremo, Verità e Justicia per la Vittima di COVID-19. We will denounce truth and justice for the victims of COVID-19. And this is important for my argument because this, this is the only uh, victims um, 
association or families of the victims association that I know uh, with COVID. For example, France has a strong movement and there is no COVID uh, victims association. And I start with the basic definition of citizenship by Anna Arendt, when she says that um, citizenship can be defined as the right to have rights. What some authors have written and, call, and told us that citizenship is always a post right. And she completes that with the notion that belonging to any form of political community. When a state fails, there must be some kind of political community that ensures that we have all the rights, the right to have rights. Going forward, I, fall, I base my uh, dialogue with you and my sharing with you on uh, my previous work. And I have worked with this Disasters and Disaster Victims Association, as it have to tell Toulouse 2001 industrial accident uh, that has gone to court and has finished, the heat wave 2003 France and Portugal, the Air France flight 447 Rio de Janeiro Paris in 2009, the environmental remediation of Iranian mines in France and Portugal, France is Bessin Limoges. Portugal is Urgericia. Let me tell you that Portugal sent, uh, sold sorry, 100 tons of depleted uranium to Germany in 2004. And there are still some tons that are in warehouses in Portugal waiting for the next uh, selling opportunity. The forest fires in Portugal 2017. And lately, the Dalits, these, these are the casts, the, untouch, the before untouchables what the Gandhi uh, uh, called the children of God. They are against this, this uh, uh, paternalistic definition of children of God. And they politically now uh, claim their names as Dalits. They are 250 million people in India. And I worked with the big federation of Dalits and Adivasi in India. Adivasi are the tribes of India. They are together, the Dalits, the caste and the um, Adivasi. And my uh, uh, sharing with you and my reflections is based on these objectives. First, to analyze which processes can suspend the status of citizenship and which can enact citizenship based on any arbitrary classification criteria, such as social class, place of residence, age, gender, nationality, geographical origin, or for example, being vaccinated or not. This is completely arbitrary and not based on any basic criteria. <clears throat> to study how citizenship and its implications are considered in public policies related to disaster and post-disaster situations, both at international and national levels, of course. And to study how the notion of citizenship is mobilized or not, by communities to further claims and grievances and to advance the struggle of counter-hegemonic human rights. Sorry, I'm sorry, there's a problem here. I'm sorry. Uh, and post-disaster situations. Going forward, this. <laughs> uh, and of course, this is very important to me, to what I do in the field with the victims associations and all that. I will show it in the end of this presentation to understand how the personal and the body through suffering, suffering and trauma becomes social and a project for the future, structuring the creation of or failing to create communities in disaster and post-disaster situations. Therefore, hence the need to study how the personal and the body can be a basis for the claiming of rights and struggles. It depends on which uh, uh, situations we are studying and in what contexts. This is a book that I uh, edited with Professor Boventura Sosa Santos uh, this year in Rutledge. Uh, he is uh, an expert and uh, he proposed the, this notion of epistemologies of the salt and that we have to put forward the ecology of knowledges. And that's what's more important for me and in this talk with you, it's the notion of intercultural translation. We uh, in the Risk Observatory and in the Center for Social Studies and working this theoretical framework, we are very close to the struggles and social movements. And we try to uh, uh, see how a social movement can learn from the other. For example, in my case, I was in The Hague 
presenting my results working with the Federation of Victims Associations of France. And the representative of the Dalits was there and said, are you going to India? And I said, yes, uh, this year, in the end of 2014, I'm going to India. And he said, when you come, contact us that we would like you to share with us what you, uh, you have learned with the uh, French uh, Victims Association. And they were very interested in what the French Victims Association did, and it was this. In 1986, the United Nations declared the universal rights or the rights of the victims of crimes. So what the Victims, uh, victims Federation of Accidents and Catastrophes and all that did is to put forward the argument that a victim of a disaster is a victim of a crime. And they managed to do that, and they managed to consecrate that in the European Directive 2012 for um, victims of crimes rights. And so this federation managed to uh, invoke the, the idea or to, push, to put forward the idea that uh, when there is a disaster, a uh, collective accident, as they call it, there is a crime and they are entitled to apply to this United Nations uh, decision and to the uh, European directive. And that's what the Dalits learned when I was there, to invoke this uh, United Nations to fight against the, the rules of the government of Modi when they have floods and all that. But I'll, I'll go forward. And in starting with the Dalits and all these victims associations, I came to the notion of dignity as the possibility of living and expressing the multiple belongings of each individual or group. In India, as a narrative context, it's very complex. But I have some questions that uh, after the field work and working closely with these organizations. <laughs> the first is, to whom and to what do we belong? Following the ethnopsychiatrist, the French Toby Nathan ethnopsychiatrist question, what do these belongings allow us to do and what do they restrict or prohibit us? Do conventional democratic spaces allow this expression of multiple belongings or are we going to the democratization process? This notion of the democratization was put forward by the historian Charles Tilly, and he argued that as long as there is social inequality and social inequality is increasing, there is a risk of the democratization processes. Um, and in th this year, 2021, Margaret Summers, a sociologist, has published uh, an important chapter calling about what she calls a predistributive democracy to contravene the influence or the, or the force of the market. And she says that the commodification of persons and social relations related also with COVID uh, induces a, a, a process that can transmit its, can, can turn itself into a de democratization process. Democracy is not acquired. And what belongings are, are mobilized to oppress or suppress others? My main question has been, and it's very simple, can a victim be a citizen? And my answer is yes, as long as you have the organization, the tools to be present with the state, the United Nations, all the entities that you have to dialogue to become a citizen. And the central question to be asked is, what can the bodies in presence, all, all, always the bodies in presence, through collective action and resistance and performative, performatively, uh, due to deconstruct the mercantile logic and force political power to restore dignity, to recognize belongings? That's a question. And for me, uh, being close to this victims association, what is essential is to analyze the construction of counter narratives as revealing the cruelty of neoliberalism and as potentiating a counter hegemonic globalization, not based on the communion of suffering or trauma. I learned this with the victims. They don't want us to have a communion of suffering or trauma, but yes, a coverage of bodies and performances that are modulators of politically significant feelings and actions. Can this be important politically? And not any suffering or trauma to or empathy with them as, as such. This goes along many of the writings of Judy, Judith Butler, uh, more recent writings. So I came to the notion, and I have been working around this notion of invisible citizenship. 
And I think, I think I propose that we must interrogate the concept of citizenship from the standpoint of non-citizens, from those who are left out without rights and guarantees. Also including those who, although normally citizens, are considered disposable or referred to a citizenship that in this case can be considered as invisible. It depends on the cases. Invisible citizenship refers to all of those who, despite being biopolitically integrated in population statistics and policies, now we are acquainted with all these statistics, how many dead, how many alive, how many this and that, do not count, are not heard, do not interest to the state project, or do not acquire greatness or media projection. Hence, I propose the need to go beyond biopolitics in the its original formulations by Michel Foucault and in his Panato politics or politics of that based only on racism. Racism is not enough as I have shown and we can see. In short, invisible citizenship affects all who are victims of indifference. This indifference results in the absence of what constitutes an essential criterion for citizenship, dignified belonging. I saw that in the uh, heat wave in France, 2003, that many people died from the upper classes. Why? They were alone in ethics. They had, they didn't, they were, they had nobody uh, alongside them, them and they, they dehydrated and died because there was nobody there to assure that they drink, they drank and then didn't, and they didn't die of a heat stroke. And what's interesting, there is a community of almost no dead people. People, families from the Maghreb, from the North of Africa, that means Algeria, Morocco, and all the countries, the people that live in France, practically no over mortality because the elderly live with the family. It's almost impossible. Of course, there is one or two cases. Almost impossible for an old man or woman to die alone because he didn't drink water. Belonging without dignity can evolve bodies that, bodies that suffer or die, contaminated with territories, like I studied, or explicit exclusionary, exclusionary policies. So my interest is it, in study, and I'm coming close to the end, don't worry. <laughs> uh, it's in disasters and social change. And I, are, I have been working this line, disasters, citizenship capital, and civic trust, of course, civic trust is a very known concept, uh, but the, to work this notion of disaster citizenship capital and to look at local actions. That is the politicization of mourning and grief of pain. And the notion of trauma, the affected, how suffering is in the basis of politics. We don't see this a lot with COVID, I must say, but in the discussion, we can go further. And the important question of memory, local memory versus of first official memory and how we frame events. And being here and talking with Ilan Shabay, uh, there is this question, why there is no COVID-19 Victims Association in France? When there is a catastrophe and a disaster, there is a protocol, a judge is immediately dominated, nominated and a victim association is constituted, not for the COVID case. So COVID is not framed as a collective accident in France, exactly like the case of the 2003 heat wave. So I'm talking with Ilan Chevet on the first day that I arrived here, the 2nd of November. Um, there is this hypothesis that I'm going to work in the future. And I thank him very much and for allowing me to put this here. COVID-19 is not framed as a collective accident but as a collective failure, as a consequence of non-coordination, but we are seeing this in all countries. COVID and heat wave, it's important to see social identities and agency and what persons, communities can and can do because both are seen as collective failures. And for the future, for my future proposals as a researcher, I'm coming to a new research question and this one that I'm sharing with you, what kind of extreme events are not framed as collective accidents? And what are the underlying conditions and consequences for this? And coming to a conclusion, the notion of uh, memory, there is this proposal by a Portuguese famous architect, Eduardo Sotomoro. He is a Pritzker Award. He won it in 2011. To, uh, uh, this is for the victims of the fire victims of 2017. I think it will never be built, but it will be built on, theoretically on a public terrain um, field, 
uh, and the local municipality will pay the works and the architect offers this, this, the, the design and all that. It will be a free pro bono. But memory can't wait, of course. So local artists with local materials built this local structure. And here on the second image, you can see a public tank where people, normally women, sexual division of labor, they wash the clothes there. And 12 people did not die because when the fire came 200 kilometers per hour at 1000 degrees, they went into the water of the tank right here and the fire went over the structure and tank and they didn't die. And this uh, uh, has invokes the Bible. And then I have to say this, uh, the, the Victim Association asks me to read the name of the people that in the 17th of June, 2017, died in this locality, in this place where the monument is. And I will read their names and I'll ask your authorization for that. Afonso Conceição, Bianca Henriques Nunes, she was three years old, Diogo Costa, Maria Odete Rodrigues, M.R., Mario Carvalho, Rodrigo Rosário, he was four years old, Sara Costa, Sara Peralta Antunes, Sidney Bachior, Rosário, Vasco Rosa. In the discussion, I can answer why only the initials, but I will say that the family did not authorize the name to be here. So how to remember all the victims of COVID-19 and all of all pandemics that affected human beings? There is a proposal. The um, Uruguayan architect, Gomes Plater, if you are interested, you can go to the internet and uh, there is a video, a small three minute video about this, proposes in the Bay of Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay, this monument here, World Memorial to the Pandemic, a space that pays tribute to life and nature uh, in Montevideo. So going to the conclusion, sorry. Uh, what I propose is to study the new regime of practices always close to the people, always close to the terrain, always close to the social movements, to the strugglers, outside the nation state and neoliberal markets, that is to look for a system change and not only one-off changes. To be attentive to social solidarities that emerge from empathy with those who lost something or someone due to extreme events or risk regulation crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic, and finally, last conclusion, to work on a scale that is relevant to the memory and history of people affected by extreme events or risk regulation crisis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jose, um, for this very thoughtful and um, yeah, sort of also very sad talk towards the end that, that is. It was very moving. I think that you invoke the, the memory of these people. Any questions? Uh, if there, oh yeah, there are several. So Flavio, you go ahead. Thank you, Pia. Uh, thank you, Professor Mendes. Thank you for your presentation. It was very, uh, very moving, very touching, but also very uh, instigating and it's connected to many of the topics I will be working in 2022. So it was very nice to see the work being done. Um, I am from Brazil. So my some of the, the some of the points that you mentioned do uh, bring me home a little bit, especially when it comes to groups that are not part of these uh, of this collective identity as uh, prescribed by the state. So who is considered Brazilian or who is considered more Brazilian than others. And just last week we had a, another a mass killing uh, by the police in Rio, eight people have been killed, um, innocent people apparently because someone in those communities had apparently targeted policemen. So that's how it has been going for the past year. So of course, most of those people are not only underprivileged, but they are part of a specific ethnic group and uh, with specific traditions. So it's, it was also nice to see and made me think a little bit about how those people are actually only heard when those and very selectively heard when those uh, tragedies take place. And, uh, but I have a very specific question here. I have several, but I think I'm gonna only make one question right now, 
uh, concerning the last part of your presentation, you were talking about the non-framing of events such as COVID-19. So my, questions, my question to you is about the intentionality of this non-framing. So how do you see this, the act of non-framing COVID-19 as intentional so that responsibilities can actually be diffused? Okay. Uh, and uh, the fight against it can be malleable and also politicized. So how intentional do you see this um, non-framing or how accidental it is in your opinion? Okay, thank you, Flavio. And uh, I will answer immediately, of course, for, the, for a dialogue. I know Brazil very well. I have been there many times and I have been studying with the colleagues, Mariana and uh, Brumadinho, but, uh, but uh, mainly Mariana. And what's interesting for the colleagues that don't know the contest, there was a rupture in an industrial dam, in a mining dam. And until today, people are not relocated yet. I never, I have been in many places in India and all that. I never saw an instance of so many years after, people are still living in hotels, pensions. Uh, the farmers are, uh, have their, uh, cattle and all that in rented uh, farms and there is no uh, future <laughs> idea where people will be living in provisional whatever that is uh, so it's interesting they are uh, not only uh, invisible in that contest but they don't have a place to live that they call their own so many years after could be provisional could be uh, uh, woods could be something but something that they could uh, call a home so thank you. No, uh, uh, Flavio, I don't think it is intentional, this non-framing. It is the, the processes that involves the COVID. It's very complex. We are witnessing science being done at the moment. Uh, please remember that the only vaccine that it is approved and can be used without, with liability for the company is Pfizer and only in the United States. FDA has approved Pfizer for the United States. In all the other countries in the world, all the vaccines that we are using are in an emergency uh, logic. So if something happens to me or to you, companies are not liable because it is an emergency situation. This is new, Flavio, it never happened before. Of course, Professor Ragnar last week talked about pandemics and the HN1, but it was very different from now, from the impact. So as Elon uh, has proposed in a dialogue uh, with me, uh, it is um, a failure of control and a failure in all aspects uh, and mainly in risk communication, I must say. Uh, uh, now, forbid me to go into a field that and a country that is not mine. But when I see the director of a Koch Institute or the federal minister of health, how they talk, that's not good for the general public. I get confused as a foreigner with the message they are trying to put forward. And then if I am confused as a foreigner, imagine the people that live and uh, here. So no, Flavio, to be uh, sincere, uh, I think it's not intentional. I think it has to do with the complexity, science being done. We are really, uh, remind this, that all we, we were talking before, uh, the different strategies in different countries about the vaccinations because we are dealing with many publications that were not peer reviewed. 90% we are doing no peer review. And when we, we are in this regime, it's the first time that we are doing and leaving science in such a mess, a mass scale uh, and have to do concrete policies, of course, because the politicians have to decide <laughs> whatever. What's strange for me, and it was very strange for me, it was uh, Professor Lothar Wheeler, um, uh, talking about the politicians and <laughs> putting the blame on the politicians. But science is not as objective as uh, uh, we can see because there is no, um, for example, for the second doses, I am a Janssen. Tomorrow it will be six months. We are being called in Portugal for the third dose and for the second for Janssen. One million people got Janssen. So what will will take, Moderna or Pfizer? Can we choose what are the, the scientific results? None, none. There, the, yesterday, uh, the European Medical Agency approved the second doses of Janssen. 
So if I'm going to take it when I return to Portugal next Tuesday, <laughs> I will take whatever it is in on there. <laughs> I won't ask. I will just put the arm up and let it give me something. Uh, and, and because I know it's very important because I have young, uh, young children, uh, sons. But sorry, I'm going to go ahead. But I don't think it's intentional. Uh, it has to do with the complexity of the phenomenon we're witnessing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much um, for the question and also the answer. Thanks. Manuel. Yes, Professor Mendes. In the first, thanks for the talk. Uh, in, the, in its first half, you you mentioned a term that you dropped somewhat later in my impression, which was uh, sovereignty and uh, public health sovereignty in, in particular. And I wondered how you addressed the tension between two, um, two arguments that come to mind when looking at the, at the pandemic. That one is the classic argument that you would say with, uh, I mean, the term in social psychology for that would be terror management. And when people or populations face an increased uh, perceived uh, increased uh, risk of um, dying, then they will stick uh, stronger to their mostly preconceived uh, or renegotiated in-group uh, and not recognize uh, the, um, the, the suffering of outgroups. Uh, so not, I mean, they, they will relate to whoever uh, then they, they feel close to be it, uh, yeah, other victims of COVID, but it could be also, uh, for instance, uh, I don't know, people who work in similar uh, professional environments or people who face uh, similar familiar situations or so. So they would, but, but the old theory would be that in, in states of emergency, so to speak, I mean, Carl Schmitt's infamous, uh, infamous definition of, the, of sovereignty was that the, uh, um, who is uh, able to define or to declare the state of emergency or state of exception uh, is the one who is the sovereign. So you would classically expect like in wars, that was what Schmidt had in mind, that there was a collective threat that unification and the, the, and the, re, the re emergence of the sovereign would be the result. What we observe is not exactly that in this situation. No? It's, it's more like that we observe fragmentation and we observe different uh, in-groups competing for who defines uh, and who has the right to define the situation. So the sovereign is not as strong as it was ever. I, in, in, in some situations, maybe, that's, what's your take on that? That would interest me. Uh, last point on that, um, if, it's, if this is not the case, if it's truly not an Agamben-like uh, resurgence of extreme sovereignty like in martial, martial uh, law, then what is it? Is it, uh, is it why is it? Uh, is it because the, the threat was not uh, perceived as big enough? Because the, the pestilence is not uh, extreme enough for people to, uh, to be overwhelmingly threatened? Or is it because it's not external and you cannot like the, the enemy is not outside the state. Uh, that could be also the case. I mean, in martial, uh, in martial, in, in, in war situations, it's clear that you can define the outgroup as every everyone who is not a citizen, which in this case you can't. So I I just wanted uh, to know how you uh, how you perceive the sovereignty problem, which you mentioned in the beginning, but then somehow lost over the talk of your of your of of, of the course of your talk in my impression. Yes, thank you, Manuel. Uh, I, I said in the beginning that I was drifting away from the notion of uh, sovereignty and going to the notion of nationalism. But what we are, what we are witnessing is clearly uh, uh, sanitary nationalism. And, that is, and last week we talked about this because there is, in Europe, the case of Europe, there is no European health policy in, in health it's very different, for example, for food safety, as I talked last, uh, uh, last Tuesday, and I'm a consultant in Portugal of the Food Safety Agency, and they follow strictly all the rules that come from the European Food Safety Agency. This is not the case for health. This is not the case. It's each country, each policy, the vaccines is so confused. I'm reading a lot to, to, to see what I'm going to take. So you, you are right. Uh, 
I think that the threat is that it's too close to us, as I, and I, as I told before, um, Flavio, uh, we are seeing, this is a thing that affects us. All of us can be infected. All of us can be in quarantine. All of, the, of us, it depends, can die or be sick. And this uh, overwhelming effect contributes for us, for us as at all, to try to defend ourselves with the means that we have. And of course, has to be with political values. I can be against vaccination. For example, I told last week, Portugal has a, a history of people going to be vaccinated for the common flu. It's, it was 87% before the COVID as for the young people. So what we are witnessing in Portugal is a trend that was there before. Uh, so we have to study what is the history of each country, incredibly, each country dealing with professionals, experts, because there's a thing that, for example, for example, Ulrich Beck didn't take into account. Uh, the medical organizations, uh, the medical board and all that, they are aside in Portugal, they were not important for the policies. They were not consulted. And it's incredible that they are highly prestigious, have uh, their strong uh, stakeholders, but they do not participate in the people that meet with the government to decide the new measures. They, they did the, uh, the meeting yesterday. And so when I return to Portugal, there will be new measures. So I think we are, we have to reflect and go beyond Agaben, Schmidt, Foucault, and we are in completely new uh, uh, fields that we have to compare with the flu of 1918. What is the impact of the flu that killed more than 60 million people in family memories, in the state memories? It's zero. It's zero. We had the, the first world, world war had ended. 60 million people died. Please look at the news of the moment. Life was normal. Concerts, uh, I mean, people want to get rid of the, the war. No one was caring about that. And many people died in Europe and the United States, of course. And we're talking about 60 million people in the collective memory. The impact is zero, uh, not zero, of course, but is minimal. So we, I think we have to gather, uh, Manuel, I don't have a, a, an answer, but uh, we have to gather um, new ways of thinking close to the people. And I have to study closely the Italian uh, example. Why do 100 families get together and form an association for compensations? That's a thing that I'm using. I have been seeing that for many years, studying in France, but I don't see it in France. I see it in Italy. Why? What's in the politics there that allows that to happen? And what are they asking for? And what is the importance of what they are asking for? And, and that's, I think, what we have to reflect so we can think about bigger things. Uh, and in the end, who could, could think that there will be no European policy for an epidemic like this? Please, let's look at the handbooks. Let's look at the risk communication handbook of the World Health Organization for Europe published in 2019. Zero, no coordination, nothing. It was a handbook to put in the garbage, the garbage bin. <laughs> Zero was for because when reality stroke, we didn't have a policy. And what we are witnessing now at this moment is a little bit appalling, having into account that we are one year and, and a half in this. So we have to learn, the politicians, the, uh, the people have to learn how to deal with this and have strict uh, uh, a policy and a risk communication policies because we have to learn to live with this and to create a policy, a, a politics, a city for this uh, because the the extreme right and the, it's very strong and it's as victims they are uh, <laughs> claiming they are victims and they are putting forward a strong movement uh, that we have will have consequences not only here but but and to finish Pierre let me say that in all this. What's odd is the role of the state, for example, in the United States. Of all the talk that we do about Trump, 
it was with him, with him, let's say, not him, but the people around him, that warp speed went ahead and that the United States government, federal government, invested billions in Pfizer, not Pfizer, but Moderna and other companies, Novavax, let's ask, to put forward these vaccines and these technologies. So the state came forward very strongly, even taking place with Germany and the famous CureVac. Remember that Donald Trump wanted to buy CureVac, it's a German company, and in the end, they were talking with Bio, BioNTech, it's, it's also German. Uh, so there was a politics and policy here that states and strong states put forward um, and invested in uh, uh, vaccines and with results. And the policy for Europe was zero. Europe bet yeah. in the horses that lost, Sanofi, GlaxoSmith, and Smith, all the companies that Europe bet on the beginning failed the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And we have to, you have to ask why. Sorry, sorry for the so long. Thank you. No, no, that's great. Yes. We have one more question. Diana, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I would actually like to come back to this uh, terminology of citizenship and invisible citizenship, which I find quite interesting. I would be interested to hear a bit more how you relate this now um, exactly to the um, to the current um, COVID crisis. Like, what is the citizenship we are talking about? Who are the citizens? Who are the invisible citizens? And maybe just from my background, I come from uh, from the energy field, um, and there uh, and very interesting terminology that kind of appeared is like around energy citizenship which yeah. basically means right that citizens take a more active role in the energy transition you have this energy communities but of course also like within this energy citizenship you maybe have people that are not involved right that are not part of it um so, so as you also explained right in this invisible citizenship there might be people that are kind of left left out right of, of actually being really involved in this whole um new energy system so just um as a brief like where i'm coming from for my thinking with the term um yeah citizenship here so what would be uh, keen to learn a little bit more how you transfer it now really and how you see it also in this context really of risk because for me it has had a lot of like opportunities and kind of positive framings of being maybe more inclusive and not talking like about citizenships maybe like holding a citizenship from a country but connecting on a different level right like um here um so yes. yeah thanks thank you diana i think we have to go back to the basic definition the right to have right <laughs> it's very polemical but has been been worked recently as a post right post after right and it's only in concrete situations, concrete events, disasters, extreme events, that we see who are the invisibles. Who will think that people from the upper classes live alone in Paris, they will die because it's very hot and they don't drink water. It's as simple as that. And it was a national catastrophe. The president had to declare a national mourning and all that. So we have to, in this vaccine, for example, let me give you the example of Portugal. We have a strict national citizenship policy. It's jus sangani. Only the people that have ascendants Portuguese can claim the Portuguese citizenship, more or less like Germany, um, more or less. Uh, but, and only 4% of the population of Portugal are foreigners. It's one of the uh, smallest proportion except for the Eastern uh, West uh, uh, European countries, 4% only of the Portuguese population are foreigners. Go, come the COVID and we have an open door policy. All the people that came to the vaccination centers were vaccinated with no papers, with no passport, with no working allowance, nothing. It's just arrive, put the sleeve up and take the vaccine. And that was not expected because the policies for Portugal are very strict relating to this. And me as a sociologist and knowing well the context, I was not expecting that. Another example, Diana, Toulouse, the explosion, the total paid the material compensations, that is to rebuild the houses and all that. But the victims associations went for against the world of life, the, the value of life, they were affected in their quality of life. So the court uh, said that Tutal had to pay all the affected people 
some compensations. It, it went from one euro, Diana, from one euro to 100,000 euros. And the judge in the end, in the court, I was there. You know what he did? He read the name of all the people that were affected. 1,200 people, he took two hours to read all the names. And you know what happened? You could collect your compensation without being a French citizen. With no papers, sans papier, no papers, nothing, you were allowed to go to the bank and collect one euro. <laughs> they didn't go, of course, 100 euros. 100 euros. So what you say, it's interesting because now citizenship is attached to everything. It's ecological citizenship. It is energy citizenship. And the basic idea for me, it's to ask who stays outside this uh, right to have rights and staying outside who dies and is affected. When I arrived to, in India, Diana, the Dalit said, forget about floodings, professor. We have floods every year in Bihar. Nepal opens the dams, the water comes down and we stay six months with the water by here. We have to live in the dams. So forget about that. For us, we, de we live in a Delhi catastrophe. We want you to talk with us about this invisible citizenship and the, the, the United Nations Declaration of Victims' Rights. And when I came, when I came, then, uh, they didn't have climate change and disaster. They didn't have it. After many discussions, if you go to the site of the uh, Confederation of uh, Adalit and Adivazid Associations, they have now a working group about climate change and disaster. Why? Because they saw with that, they could put forward their grievances to the United Nations, of course, and go into the programs of the Sendai program, of course, to apply for the money of the Sendai beyond the Indian government. Because you know, you know, after 2004, India came strongly in the field of civil protection and risk governance and management and all that. And so they used that to go forward and, for example, to work what they call climate citizenship. And they are using that to put forward their grievances and what they want in a strategically way. And they learned with the colleagues in France that were doing the same for this accident collective, this ac uh, collective accident. I know I didn't answer, but you have to study specifically what is citizenship doing? How are people are claiming citizenship for what? And for example, to have the vaccine and not be sick. <laughs> but when the worker gets out of vaccination center, the police can be there to ask for the working papers. <laughs> so not, not uh, uh, a minute after they will be inter interpelled to, to, to answer for that. So it's only in the vaccination center that they are citizens as all. But it didn't happen like this in all the countries, I know. Thank you. One final question, Alexandra. Uh, thank you very much. So yeah, thank you very much for your very insightful uh, presentation. And I also wanted to ask more about the topic um, all around climate change or the climate crisis and uh, the debate about adaptation uh, to climate, uh, to the climate crisis. And uh, you just mentioned several points actually that I wanted to address too. But uh, I was wondering if you're following also the international debate around that topic uh, when we speak about who are victims, uh, what is, is like how important they are considered, also like comparing uh, in general the cost of uh, the climate crisis in the global south compared to the global north and also inside countries. And there's also like one example that I know in, is from Brazil as well where the uh, CEMADEN, uh, the uh, monitoring center for natural disasters was founded by, uh, Dil by the Dilma government uh, be because of a crisis that just happened when she entered uh, into office. So, and there's also, I think, yeah, as, as you've been mentioning a very, it's very contested, like who is considered to what degree um, an important citizen to be protected from disasters or not. Yes, thank you. This is not my field of expertise. I have been working, but not directly. I've, I know the Victor Marcazzini the, <laughs> that coordinates the, the center that you talked about. I know him personally, uh, but I will say that I have been working locally uh, in, with the municipalities that we, we implemented the, the social vulnerability index and with the region, the center region of Portugal about the impact of climate change. 
And I like to think about that working in the field, uh, what uh, Rebecca Elliott proposed, the sociology of loss. What do we lose with climate change or with sustainability? <laughs> that is, don't look at what we're going to preserve. Let's look at what we're going to lose. Are people willing to lose some of the things that they do, for example, traditional harvesting. I live in a town that has all the disasters and floods every year, Coimbra, it's uh, fire, forest fires, it's, uh, uh, it's um, hurricanes, it's uh, floods and all that. And I've, we have been working closely with the people and the schools, of course, uh, there are many, many science citizen uh, projects with us. And what we're lose, looking at, and let me say this, I am in the Sustainability uh, Institute, of course, but it's very difficult to put solidarity between generations forward. The idea that the present generation have to work with the future generation. That doesn't work much in the field. It's very difficult to implement. So what we're going to, we have been working is in concrete aspect is what are the old generations or the oldest people going to lose? Are they willing to lose it? Or are they going to stick to it? <laughs> and then in this process, what they can share with the youngest generations that both the generations, oldest, middle age and all that uh, can come forward and agree that those things have to go. This is a project that we are uh, working in concrete because the, the, the terms, the reports, 1.5 degrees, it's very abstract to the people. But when you have a flood, when you have a forest fire, it, uh, Alexander, let me tell you, and I was talking with this with PA yesterday. The, in 2017, in Portugal, 56 people died in June, and 60 died in October. The same year, June is normally not hot. Normally, it's July, August. In June, it was 40 degrees, and in October, imagine October, normally it's five or six degrees. It was 40 degrees again. So. People in the field felt what is climate change in concrete, having fires where they were not supposed to, to, to have fires in June and October. And that, that's why many people died. They were not expecting the behaviors, uh, how they dealt with the fire. They never imagined that in June or October, a fire like that could be possible. And the people in October never imagined that after June, the firefighters didn't learn anything. <laughs> So they could apply in October because the October fire, it's on the literal and it affects resorts, hotels. It's not a fire for the poor, like the June. It's a fire that affects resorts, hotels, uh, big towns. Uh, we have central gardens burning in big towns, towns of 100,000 people, 60,000 people. It was not a rural fire. So this oddity, this out of normal uh, phenomenon. Now you can talk with people that live there and talk about climate change. They know they have to change because they don't want another fire like that. They don't want to lose the close ones like the one that I read, the people that I read. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jose, for your very um, insightful talk. And thanks to colleagues for your questions and the discussion. Thank you very much. And um, I think um, you you are leaving you are leaving in three weeks, right, okay. Jose? No, no, no. Yes. I'm leaving next Tuesday. Oh, next Tuesday. I'm sorry. So, um, yes, but I think you might be still around for virtual yes. uh, talk. We are not supposed to to uh, show up at the office, but um, I am in the office. <laughs> Well, okay. <laughs> Exceptions are uh, allowed, I think. But in general, we, we have been called back to, to sort of working, working from home. So still, um, I think uh, sort of the, the discussions have been very fruitful and interesting and inspiring for our work also. So thank you very much and have a great day, all of you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.